and for the event, and we will uh, start shortly with uh, a presentation from Kizito Odiambo, who is the uh, founder of Agribor, and who you know from the uh, six module videos. And then we will uh, we will uh, welcome uh, Pierluigi Milone for uh, his presentation about uh, FAST, and we will follow each of this presentation with a Q&A session. Uh, you are free to use the chat. Please note that it is moderated, so it, you may have uh, some time before your answer uh, appear in it. And uh, for the Q&A session, if uh, you have uh, any questions that is left unanswered, uh, please go to the forum and uh, ask them here. We will uh, try to answer them as soon as possible. So I will now leave the floor to Kizito, and uh, you can now start your mic and your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Benjamin. Good um, evening, uh, good morning, good afternoon from wherever you are. Um, my name is Kizito Diambo. I'm very excited to be able to be with you this um, evening. I am speaking to you from Darmstadt in Germany. So many greetings from uh, my home office um, in Germany. I hope all of you are, um, are well and safe in these difficult times. And I hope you've been having a very exciting, um, yeah, uh, mock period uh, going through the different um, the different activities that have been lined up. Uh, today, I would like to talk to you about um, the use of satellite data for land use change, um, for land use and land use change monitoring specifically. And uh, I'm coming here with my background basically as um, electrical engineer and uh, sensor developer. I studied electrical engineering and information technology in the University of Darmstadt around six years ago and um, have been uh, working with smallholder farmers in uh, Kenya specifically for the last five years. Um, I started working with satellite data over four years ago and it's been a really exciting process for me and for my company. And I'm excited to just share with you here about um, what we have been able to do and uh, also engage with you through uh, during, the, during the question uh, session. Um, so without um, much ado, I will just um, start my presentation. Um, today, I want to talk about, to talk about um, the use of uh, Sentinel-2 in, in particular um, for land use change and um, for land use change monitoring for urban areas and for agriculture. And uh, after that, with those two use cases, we will then be able to have a session where I can be able to go into most of your questions. So I will try and keep myself short uh, during this period so that uh, we can be able to um, engage more during the Q&A session, yeah? All right, perfect. So, um, one thing that I want to really mention at the beginning is um, when you look at satellite data and when you're looking at uh, Sentinel data, to be specific now, Sentinel-2 data, which is an optical, right? It's an optical satellite which gives us optical imagery. Um, there are just so many different opportunities of using this satellite, uh, the satellite data that we get from Sentinel-2. One, because it has a very high temporal resolution. So at least every two to five days, we have a, sent a satellite image um, for a location over the, over the, in, on, on the app. Um, and two, we have a very high um, spatial resolution, right? So we have an image pixel at 10 meters, and that opens up opportunities which were not there before. If we're looking at the opportunities of using Landsat, uh, which was at 30 meter resolution and coming around every two weeks. And right now we are having 10 meter resolution. So even the smallest uh, pieces of land, like for smallholder farmers in Kenya who have less than one acre piece of land, one acre is basically half a football field. So even that kind of land, you're able to really analyze using satellite images. And you can do different things by combining the, the information that is transported by just this one image, right? Because we're talking about the different bands that are available in the Sentinel-2 image. So you're not just taking a Google image, you're just taking, you're just taking a picture like how we're taking it to our phones. We're basically taking a picture that is loaded with spectral bands, which you can analyze for different use cases. And I've just shown here a list of um, the different bands, so the most common band combinations 
uh, because we know that we have around um, 16 different spectral bands um, with Sentinel-2. So you combine, um, sorry, let's say 13 different spectral bands, sorry, uh, with, with Sentinel-2, which you can combine differently, right? So if you combine the fourth band with the second and third band, you can be able to really identify many things about um, the natural color. If you want to generate an image that looks like the Google image, what we normally call the false color image, you're able to generate these kind of images um, or products out of these spectral bands. So this is just one of the ways of looking at the different bands that are available on Sentinel-2, and now we can be able to use that to identify different um, spectral uh, products, right? So when you're talking about spectral products, we're talking about products such as, I want to identify vegetation. I would want to identify water. I want to identify built up areas, right? Um, so on the left side, um, I've brought you, I've just zoomed into um, the city of Nairobi in Kenya. And um, on the right side, I have taken out an image of Sentinel-2. It's not very bright, but I hope you can still be able to um, see the traces of how Nairobi looks from the top with the satellite image. And um, this is basically a first indication of um, a first indication of a spectral product, which is basically a true color image from Sentinel-2, which we have obtained by combining the red band, the green band, and the blue band of the Sentinel-2 image of this month. So I can do this for any other time that I want to access this data and actually just get a general feel of how this image basically looks like if I want to compare it with something like, for example, leaflet or Google images. Um, so when you're looking at the spectral product, this is really now where you start generating value, right? You want to generate value out of satellite data. And my question for you for today is basically looking at how do I generate value which can be monetized, right? Um, it's something, it's good to have. It is open data, so anybody can access it from wherever. But what are the products that I can generate out of satellite data, which I can actually get to the market with and sell? Um, so before I go into that uh, specific um, issue, I will then just give further examples of uh, spectral products that can be generated. So we're talking about agriculture. And when you're looking at the different spectral products, then you are also able to look at how you can analyze the different spectral bands um, for agricultural use cases, for example. And you have different indices which you can generate. Basically, these are mathematical expressions which you use to calculate um, the combination of bands. So, for example, when you're looking at the normalized difference vegetation index, um, this is basically an index that tells you how green the area is that you are analyzing. So you can analyze the pixel and get values from between um, minus one to one. One being very green um, and minus one, of course, being the opposite and bare soul will basically be at around zero. So when you're able to derive this kind of information from uh, satellite data, you can actually generate um, um, a map that gives you the vitality of an area. You can be able to know is this a built-up area or is this an ocean, right? For example, is it a built-up area? Um, can also be able to identify if this pixel actually represents water. So the beauty of it is that um, these are data points that remain stable. So if you imagine uh, the analysis of uh, green um, vegetation, you know when it is at maximum, and that is when you expect the vegetation, the NDVI, uh, to be one, for example. And you know if you're having an NDVI that is close to zero, you're basically looking at either bare soil or non-photosynthetic uh, vegetation. <clears throat> so with this kind of examples, then we get a very good idea about how we can start analyzing spectral bands to provide products which we can work with. Um, and one way of then combining the different spectral bands to now get a better image is now looking at something that we uh, call land fractional cover. So you'd want to know the piece of land that I am analyzing using satellite data, what is on it, right? So you can be able to actually go to the specific pixel and identify if this is green matter, this is bare soil, if this is a built up area, if this is a water, water encatchment area. You're able to look at these different um, 
uh, kinds of products, and then you can combine them together and have a fractional cover. And so what you have in this map is basically the combination of different spectral products where you can see green representing uh, photosynthetic vegetation, uh, red representing non-photosynthetic vegetation, and bare soil um, generally. So you're able to identify this kind of and if you look at this image, it is uh, quite similar to the image that I had shared before across uh, Nairobi, where you see there is a forest at the center and you have uh, built up areas um, outside the area of interest. And there is a road that you can be able to see that is uh, basically separating built up area from the forest area. So this kind of information you're then able to actually see here from the satellite. And now what this gives you is like Google Images, which get um, updated at different intervals, so you don't have every 10 days a new Google image uh, to look at. With satellite data like this, you can be able to then set up a monitoring for the area. You maybe want to monitor if this forest land is reducing, if people are uh, cutting down trees. So you can be able to set up that monitoring tool because the pixel values are going to be changing um, and you're able to notice that quite fast. Um, with that kind of information now, I would just go and look at what we at Agribora are using this kind of data for. So the most important thing for us is um, we are using satellite data for the agriculture sector. And um, at Agribora, we are focusing on making farmers and farmer fields visible, accessible, and then the farmers themselves bankable. What do I mean? By visible, I mean we want to make sure that farmers can be identified and their farms can be identified. Unlike in Europe, where most of the fields are already, um, are already categorized and ha you have a cadastral system for the different fields in a country, for example, here in Germany, that is the case. If you go to Kenya, um, land has been subdivided over generations. And at some point, you don't really know who this land belongs to because the title deed shows the grandfather who actually already passed away, but the land has been subdivided to the children but there is no um, official documentation of that. So when you're going to a bank to request for a loan to actually buy fertilizer and seed for your field, it becomes very difficult for them to actually know, are you working on this land? Whose land uh, is this? And what is happening on that field? So what we do is we make sure that we, first of all, make the farmers and the fields visible by georeferencing them, by really drawing the field boundaries of the fields that they are working on and then capturing information about what they're doing on those fields. So where satellite data is helping us is it is helping us to monitor the phenology. And by phenology, I'm talking about the different stages of vegetation growth. So you can imagine when you are basically planting a field, the soil is bare. For example, the area that is around uh, here, you see this is bare soil. Then two, three weeks later, this crop starts germinating and then the green matter increases and it reaches a climax after let's say two to three months, depending on which crop you are you're doing. And then it falls when you're harvesting and then you start the cycle again. So you're able to do this monitoring and doing this monitoring and assessment, you can be able to identify the start of the season. You can identify the peak of the season where the vegetation was at a maximum and also when the season ended. What you can also do is, as I have shown in this image, because you're not just geo-referencing one field, you can actually compare one field with, with different fields in the same area, probably the same agroecological zone or the same area that receives the same amount of uh, rainfall. And you can then do anomaly detection and classification. So you can be able to give your client, for example, a, a bank or an insurance agency, information about how is this field performing, this field of soybean performing, um, which was planted at the same time with field B in the same area. So how is it performing? And it can also give you indications of what are some of the limiting factors uh, to the potential yield. Is it uh, the management practices? Do they plant later because you're able to identify that? Is it the weather conditions? So these are some of the information that you're able to get out of the satellite data and actually present it in a report that um, insurer, that a bank can use to actually then um, provide financial services against. But there are also different use cases that you can use uh, for that as well. For example, a government wanting to monitor crop uh, growth, uh, for example, an irrigation scheme. We have an irrigation scheme in Kenya where um, a lot of maize is being grown for the local consumption. And the, 
the, the government wants to be able to monitor the development of the field. So we're talking about a thousand hectares, which you cannot really send somebody to the ground to analyze. But if you have such kind of a system, it gives you that kind of information as an output. And finally, something else that we are doing is, of course, we are doing crop type mapping. Now, the fact that you have a spectral band, you are also able to understand how the spectral indices of maize compare to the indices of beans. So we're talking about um, crop type discrimination. So you can discriminate sorghum from sunflower, from maize, because they all have different uh, peak levels. They all saturate at different levels. And that way, you using different algorithms, um, machine learning, artificial intelligence, you're able to basically train your model to pick and then identify, okay, this is actually can be a maize field with a percentage accuracy and probability, and this can be potentially um, a bean field. Um, moving on uh, because of time, um, I was just indicating about now how you can get that qualitative kind of data into a quantitative kind of analysis. So here what you're seeing is we're looking at the same vegetation index over different years, and we're able to see different things. First of all, we are able to see how the vegetation over a piece of land, which is this red box on the right here, how the vegetation index over that piece of land, so you can look at it as a farm uh, where a crop is being grown, how it has been changing. So you can be able to see that you have uh, typically um, the growing seasons that you have. Sometimes you had two growing seasons in a year. Sometimes you had only one growing season in a year. So that can already give you indication of was that a long, long, long uh, cropping season crop, for example, maize, which takes six months or eight months to be uh, to grow, or was that a short rain, a short, a short term crop, such as beans, for example, or vegetables. But you can also be able to see how the different factors, uh, so how the years compare uh, to each other. Um, I hope this gives you just a bit of insight about how you can use satellite data in agriculture. There are, of course, numerous other use cases, as I said also in my uh, videos, about how you can use these uh, satellite images in agriculture, also in precision agriculture, when you want to apply nitrogen or fertilizer and you want to know where should I apply more fertilizer and where should I apply less fertilizer. So they are just so many different ideas of how to use it and this is just one of the examples that i wish to share with you today how you can also be able to start training your own uh projects and ideas and turning them into a business case um the last section that i want to go into is of course we want to look at urban development and urban development of course um i want to be specific and look at the sustainable development goals of the united nations and one of these development goals is an sdg goal 11 is sustainable cities and communities. Now, um, the good thing about the SDGs is it's not just um, a goal which is 1 to 17 and that's it. Um, there are indicators of are we really achieving our goals, right? So the indicator 11.3.1 under uh, sustainable cities and communities is basically um, to provide a metric to determine whether or not land consumption is scaling responsibly. And land consumption is saying, are we, um, are the, is the built up area uh, growing too fast uh, that we are saying, okay, at some point we're not going to have any more land for more people or is that growing responsibly? And you can actually be able to monitor that using satellite data. And the Joint Research Commission of the European Union has developed uh, different data and tools of how you can do this, uh, something called the Global Human Settlement Layer which you can use basically to analyze um, these particular metrics. Now, I want to show you how you can do that basically with satellite data. And basically, it's a formula. And uh, if you want to look at the indicator SDG 11.1.3, the indicator for it is basically uh, you divide the land consumption rate by the population growth rate, right? So you need to look at those two metrics. Now, population growth rate, you're basically going to get from the national census information that you, uh, you have access to uh, from the government, because that is mostly also public data. And when you're looking at land consumption rate, um, think back to the spectral bands and the spectral products that I was talking about, where we were talking about the land fraction that is under bare soil, photosynthetic vegetation, vegetation and non-photosynthetic vegetation. So if you have those two kind of categories, you can basically set up your 
you can set up your uh, your formula right um, where you look at census data um, so here you have the population growth rate which basically looks at the total population for the current year uh, to the initial year and you, say, you divide that with the number of years that uh, you are calculating for and the land consumption rate basically is looking at the area at the current year and the area at uh, the at the initial year and this is now where you can now factor in um, the kind of spectral band uh, the spectral products that we had so for Kenya, for example, we have this data available for 2000, 2015, which I was using. And for the urbanization proxy, basically, I looked at the bare soil. So the amount of bare soil within, uh, within a region. So we did this for, um, for Mombasa, and you're able to then uh, generate your index uh, or your indicator for is the land consumption growing uh, responsibly um, or not. And what you can see here from a satellite image, basically, when you're looking at the proxy for urbanization using satellite data, that would be the bare soil, um, because bare soil has a different value vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the pixel value of uh, built-up area, right? So that is what you're looking at using as a proxy. And you can then see how uh, the urbanization has changed between 2000 and 2015, and you can basically then compare that with the population of that city during the same period, and then you have your indicator um, summarized. So um, with that, um, just a very quick go through about the opportunities that satellite data provides, especially Sentinel-2 data for agricultural monitoring, uh, looking at the vegetation change, looking at uh, land use and um, start of the season, end of the season, comparison between different fields, urbanization and land degradation and deforestation, as I have shared, looking at identifying a proxy for the particular metric that you want uh, to, um, to analyze. Um, of course, the advantage that we have with Sentinel-2 that has really opened up a lot of opportunities for us is the fact that uh, Sentinel-2 data has a higher temporal resolution every uh, two to five, three to five days, depending on where you are. Um, at the equator, you have it every five days. At the north and south points, you have it uh, much faster. So every two, three days, you have an image of Sentinel-2. And of course, the resolution, the spatial resolution at 10 meters makes it possible for us to do even more than what we were actually doing with Landsat data at 30 meters or MODIS data, which is available for a longer period, but only at 250 meters. There are, of course, limitations. And the main limitation that we have with Sentinel-2 is the fact that it is affected by cloud cover. So this is the challenge that we are seeing with optical imagery. And that is where radar images, so basically radar images from Sentinel-1, for example, comes in handy to actually help you because during the cropping season, a lot of rain, if there's a lot of rain, there are a lot of clouds, and that means that it is, you're not able to actually monitor the fields uh, using optical data. So using satellite image uh, from Sentinel-1, for example, can support you with that. But of course, uh, the last thing that we always say also as a business, um, you, you will not be able to convince everybody by just showing them remotely sensed data. Ground truthing is always necessary. So if you want to set up your machine learning models, you need to be able to collect data on the ground for which to valid, to calibrate and validate your models with. And also when you want to sell a product on the ground, you also need to have your boots on the ground basically to have that ground truthing information uh, for, your, for your systems. Um, thank you very much everybody for your attention up to this point. I hope you find this insightful and I look forward to uh, your questions um, that are going to come through. Thank you. The Q and A session. So you are free to ask your question in the chat, and we will uh, display them for Kizito to answer. Thank you. Okay, Alexandra. Alexandre um, is asking. Uh, congratulations, representation. Um, how much time did you take to develop and implement that before? Uh, and how much people were involved in this project? Could you tell us a little bit about the challenges facing the project? Wow, great question. So I have been working on the Agribora project for three years, and um, I just signed up my first clients uh, this year. And um, right now, I have a team of four people that are really looking at the technology part. 
but I have another team of around uh, seven people on the ground that are engaging with clients. So we have a team um, together of around um, 11 people all together at Agribora, and we have been working on this project uh, the, last, um, the last three years. The biggest challenge we have faced is that um, it has been very difficult to convince people about um, relying on remotely sensed data because people re prefer really having the ground truthing. I'd rather have a field agent to confirm that something has been grown. And um, it really takes a lot of time to convince a client about relying on data uh, coming from uh, satellites. But this year has been good because through COVID and uh, with the lockdowns that we have seen, more clients were actually more willing to look at data and look at how data can support them still generate data from the ground. So that's, those have been challenges that we have been facing, but also looking at how COVID has supported us. I would say COVID has really helped us show that uh, having access to remotely sensed data can support uh, your activities. Uh, next question. Uh, what has been the response from the farmers using your product? Uh, that is um, Dijan Simonis. I hope I'm saying your name, your name correctly. Um, the response from farmers, basically, the, the thing is um, farmers hardly re re relate with our product in terms of the satellite images and all that. It's really for the client. And the client, in our case, is an agri-processor who wants to collect the yield at the end of the season from the farmer. Um, or the bank or the insurer who wants to basically have an early warning or a monitoring system. So farmers are not directly exposed to NDVI and all these technical uh, terminologies and reports that we generate. They are mainly meant for our clients who want to have a basic overview of the, of the, of the season. And the response has been great because the first thing they're saying is, I am now able to aggregate information of 1,000, 10,000 farmers at the press of a button that they can be able to identify the regions that need me to address and the regions that are doing very well. So what we're doing for farmers basically is we send them agro advisories based on the analysis that we run. So they don't look at the data per se, but we send them SMS advisories that we say, um, we are comparing their vegetation index with the other, their neighbors, for example, and we see that their vegetation index is quite low. So we then actually are able to send them information about um, finding out if they have planted late, what should they do, should they maybe do apply top dressing fertilizer to improve the vigor of their crops. That is how farmers are actually interacting with our product, but not directly through uh, the analytics that we are running with uh, the satellite images. Next question. How do you separate bare soil and built up areas? In my experience with land cover classification, this can be quite difficult. Um, thanks, uh, Martin Hag. Um, what we do for this basically is uh, we have our machine learning algorithms that look at the data that we collect on the ground. So we have taken some time to digitize built up areas over cities. And um, we have been able to um, collect data about bare soil. So to just briefly describe that what we look at is we look at um, we look at a time scale. So we look at a built up area and we look at the pixel changes, the pixel value changes that are um, identified. And you see that with bare soil, there are a few cases where you are able to identify um, slight changes in the pixel values compared to uh, built up areas which hardly change. So this is mainly, um, we have been doing this mainly through machine learning algorithms to really be able to discriminate uh, the two. Next question. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, besides rather images, what other workarounds do you use for dealing with cloud cover? Um, so apart from radar images, um, basically, uh, thanks Diego, uh, Diogo for your question. We have been um, working really a lot on comparing um, Sentinel-2 um, Sentinel data with uh, radar images. But what we have also been looking at is um, also using Landsat data. Now, the, the challenge with using Landsat data, of course, is the, ch the difference in um, 
spatial resolution, right? Uh, Landsat is coming at 30 meters, while uh, Sentinel is coming at 10 meters. However, depending on the use case, and um, now if you're having a field that is big enough that you can say you still have enough uh, pixel values from a Landsat image, then we actually look at if we are able to have a good image from Landsat that can be able to replace the satellite, um, the Sentinel image. And if not, then we resort to using a radar image. If that is not the case, then we basically skip that week and then wait for the next week's image and then compare that. So we generate our reports every two weeks and that gives us time to at least have two, two week data basically or uh, two images for us to pick one of. So it is either we will get quality data from Landsat that can be matched to what we are working on or we use uh, the Sentinel-1 or Sentinel-2 uh, data. Uh, what are the skills um, of your teams, their background and school training? Um, this is um, Jean-Luigi Renzi. Thank you. Um, so we have um, in our team, the people who are working on satellite data have a background in uh, geography, climatology, and um, data science. Um, and that's basically the main thing that um, that has helped us. Basically, um, if you have somebody with uh, very good um, in, in information about geography, is able to use GIS tools, um, is able to look at data science and how to basically work with different algorithms, that has really helped us. Um, and then, of course, now when it comes to the business case, then it's now basically really the IT competence of the team. So. IT competence we're talking about. Uh, we have built our system a lot around Python because we can use Python for the data science and also to build the web platform um, for the client. So that has really helped us to get, um, uh, has helped us because we have a team that is very strong in Python and that helps us in not only the analysis of the satellite data, but also in building the web applications that uh, we're using for the business uh, business case. And um, in terms of school training, we are looking at um, the team members are basically coming um, with uh, around master's degree in those um, in those areas. Next question. Um, how many clients do you already have and how many do you need for your business to be sustainable? Okay, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Luigi. Um, so in terms of clients right now, we have uh, two clients because uh, um, we have just signed on the first clients um, after August of this year, once business started picking up. We hoped this would be a bit higher at the beginning of the year as we were, as we were operationalizing our business model, but because of COVID, um, we have been slowed down. But um, the client is driven by the number of farmers on the platform. So right now we have uh, 20,000 farmers on the platform and that basically helps us drive uh, the client uh, approach also because at the end of the day, our clients are, um, for example, uh, banks and insurance companies. So it's a business of volumes. So we are really concentrated this year because the client um, increase has been slow. We have been really focusing on increasing the number of farmers, increasing the number of fields on the platform and then be able to really uh, pick up the number of clients also for next year. And uh, we expect, of course, um, it's really a, a volume. I think um, by, the end of, uh, by the end of this year, we expect to have 50,000 farmers on the platform. We are having around 1,000 1, farmers coming onto the platform every day at the moment because we are very active. So we expect to have 50,000 farmers on the platform. And we believe that we should be sustainable once we reach 100,000 farmers of which we expect 40% to be active on the platform. By active meaning they are linked to a particular client. Next question. <clears throat> I see different mobile applications for crop monitoring. I try different ones. I would like to inquire about accuracy of which crop type I can monitor, especially for small areas that can't be detected with Sentinel. Which best crop can I monitor from Sentinel? Is there a specific crop type with significant signature and criteria to detect? Um, my thank you. Um, I would um, I would say the experience that we have had so far is uh, with um, 
the typical crops that are grown in the area. So we have had good experience with the normal crops such as maize, soybean, um, sorghum, uh, so cash crops basically. We have not done um, more work um, on horticulture, for example, um, such as tomatoes, capsicum. Um, so we have had good experience with um, the basic kind of uh, crops, such as um, the food, the, the cash crops that I have mentioned. Um, I would um, I would not say um, um, I am aware of any particular crop that is not really feasible. It's really a question of the size of land that you are monitoring, because if you have, uh, for example, the challenge with um, with a 10 meter resolution is if you have a lot of intercropping within that uh, within that pixel, then you're not really able to get a lot of information out of it. But if you have one hectare of uh, tomatoes, I can imagine that you're still able to um, identify um, a signature out of it that you can be able to analyze. Next question. Thanks. Um, how can one utilize your services? I am a farmer. So if you're a farmer um, at, in, um, in Kenya, then um, you can um, visit our website and you're able to get more information about how to, uh, how to register. Uh, you basically register using your mobile phone. So you don't need to have a smartphone. You can use a simple feature phone and use the USSD technology. So you have a code which you can basically call and you are then then you can register by filling in your details about um, the location where you live and uh, you can set up a farm and then you're able to start accessing services so you can be able to register to receive weather information you can register to receive uh, market information and get access to inputs so that is how you can be able to utilize our service um, but like i said we are now in kenya and um, more information can be found on our website. So just agribora.com. You should be able to get information and also a phone number there, um, how to get, um, how to continue uh, to use our service. Next question. Sorry, I'm going quite fast because of time, but um, I hope I'll be able to cover. I see so many questions are coming in. How do you ensure privacy of farmers? Uh, you talked about monitoring of adjacent fields, et cetera, without owner's knowledge. Um, thanks, Aston, a very critical question, especially looking at data privacy and um, security. So the one thing that we do, of course, is uh, we only monitor fields of farmers that are available on the platform. And for you to get to the platform, then you also need to accept the terms and conditions. And these are some of the information that you accept uh, when you are uh, uh, um, joining the platform that you have a very, of course, we, we take into consideration that farmers need to be given free prior information about how the data is being used, especially when uh, you're talking about them getting access to credit. So the moment that you, a farmer is requesting for credit through the platform, then they have to uh, allow you to basically monitor their, their field, and they know that you're basically comparing their field with adjacent with adjacent fields. So this is basically how we make sure that that is um, taken care of. One, we have the terms, the terms of uh, the terms of the farmers. Farmers um, basically opt into the service, so they know what they are they're signing uh, they signing up for. And of course, we do not then we do not sell this information. So we have um, we have our binding service level agreements with the clients about what they are able to extract from the platform and. Uh, they're not able to, come to, um, to do. And of course, being a European company and uh, working in East Africa, we try and marry the GDPR uh, rules and regulations with the local data policy and um, um, policy uh, policies in Kenya, for example, which give us also an opportunity to make sure that we can um, maintain the privacy of farmers on the platform. Next question. Uh, thank you. Can you emphasize on the use of satellite image for assessing SDG 11.3.1? Uh, thanks, Eric. Uh, basically, what um, if I can do that again with just a minute? What um, what I was basically emphasizing with uh, um, monitoring SDG, looking at the indicator 11.3.1, we need um, the indicator basically supposed to give you a metric to measure 
the level of which land use or land consumption is changing uh, responsibly. So uh, you want to be able to compare how much land is being built up vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the population growth. So you have two metrics that you want to basically compare and have an index uh, out of it. So what you're doing is you're basically dividing um, the information of the built up area or the land use, right, with the population. So the, the higher the population, the higher uh, the land use change is also going to be. So this is one of the metrics that you're using. And now depending on how often you're able to get population data, um, for example, in Kenya, we just had the last census last year and the last one was done 10 years ago. So you could basically look at, do you have population data changing every year or every five years? And based on that kind of population change data, you can then um, identify um, the metric now for yourself by looking at, okay, if I look at satellite images of the same area, so the same region of interest, how many pixels of this area of interest have changed over the years from photosynthetics or vegetative land to built up area or just bare soil? And how has the population change uh, been over the same uh, region of interest for the same period? And then you're able to derive that metric, which can basically give you a metric to report against SDG 11.3.1. I hope that is a bit, brings a bit more light into it. If not, uh, then um, feel free to just um, raise um, further questions um, in the forum and I can be able to respond to them uh, there. I see I have three more minutes, so I will go to the next question. Do you think that hyperspectral imagery would be useful for monitoring ordinary forming or just for specific cases? Um, thanks a lot, uh, Diogo. Um, it really brings, it really makes a difference when you have hyperspectral imagery because with uh, depending on the images that you're going to use, for example, from um, um, also the resolution that you get, for example, from um, um, forgetting the name uh, planet, for example, at three meter um, three meter spatial resolution, or even you're also able to get these days um, satellite cubes with um, uh, sub meter level. So if you're really interested in doing um, more analytics or monitoring, so this is really going to respect the precision agriculture. So if you want to be able to maybe discriminate, um, identify pest and disease, 10 meter resolution um, or spectral bands at 10 meter resolution become, uh, are not really act, um, the best for it. So depending on the use case, um, I would recommend, yes, uh, you can look at it. Of course, the limiting factor for that is the cost. So um, hyperspectral Im images come with cost because they are commercial images, um, but you're still able to derive a lot of value from um, open source data such as Sentinel and Landsat. Um, so Sentinel data, of course, at 10 meter resolution can give you a lot to do the basic monitoring that can give already the first insights. But if you really want to go into a uh, precision kind of agriculture at a high detailed level, uh, then a hyperspectral imagery uh, would uh, make sense. Especially, for example, in an area such as smallholder agriculture where you have a lot of intercropping. You have maize next to beans and some tomatoes. It becomes very difficult for you to use one pixel, which is 10 meter by 10 meter, so 100 square meters, to really give any valuable information. Um, you need to be very convinced that the data that you have is um, quite homogeneous. Otherwise, then it'd be, it would be important to bring in the hyperspectral um, images. Maybe I can take one more question. Okay, uh, great. Is there opportunity for universities in Kenya to cooperate? Absolutely, uh, Jean Simonis. I think uh, that would be really good if we can um, get in touch. Um, either through our website, Agribora, uh, or through the forum. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities that we have already been looking at. Uh, we have interns who have been working with our organization to uh, basically generate ground data, which we use for our machine learning algorithms. That is the one way that we really work with, um, with universities in Kenya. But there are also many more opportunities of looking at if it is in the data dimension, or if it is basically just looking at how to provide better agricultural um, advisories based on satellite data 
um, how to how to be able to disseminate this kind of information. So um, please reach out to me. I think that would be a very nice opportunity to look at how we can uh, cooperate and also bring the youth into agriculture and uh, look at the data dimension um, with that. Thank you very much, everybody, for your questions. I'm sorry if I've not been able to capture some of these questions, but please feel free to um, uh, use the forum. I think most of these questions will also be taken to the forum, uh, if I'm not wrong, Benjamin, and I will be able to respond to these questions there. Thank you once again, and uh, back to you, Benjamin. Thank you very much, Kizito, for uh, your presentation and your Q&A session. So if uh, you still have an answer question, we will be very glad to uh, welcome you to the forum. Uh, ask them here, and we will uh, forward them to Kizito so that he can answer you uh, in uh, with a bit more time uh, than during this event. So thank you very much, Kizito. Uh, now we will start the presentation uh, with uh, Pierre Luigi. So Pierre Luigi, if you can uh, hear me correctly, you can now start your microphone and your camera, and we will uh, start your presentation as soon as you are ready. Hello, Pierre Luigi. I can see you well. I, I'm here. And um, I'm sharing my screen. You can hear me? Yes, perfectly well. And you can see the presentation? Same, we can see it. OK, I can start. OK, I uh, leave the floor to you then. Thank you. So I'm, uh, I will talk about uh, some uh, uh, different use of information uh, uh, get from the Copernicus program and uh, um, applied in uh, agriculture. And now this information with uh, all the new techniques that are now developing um, in the last year in agricultural sector will help farmers to do better their, their work or their farming. Uh, just uh, in the beginning, I would like to stress the, the concept that agriculture is uh, one of the larger sectors addressed by the Copernicus program. Uh, it's important to know that because with the information that we get from satellites like uh, leaf area index or no far eyes, different vegetation or, or also the soil water, surface soil moisture or all, all kind of uh, uh, data, uh, all these data are important to justify the farming that farmers are applying in their land. Uh, this is important uh, in, uh, in the specific uh, new system of CAP for is important for two main reasons. Uh, first is uh, just to give an answer with uh, an objective information or an objective data or uh, uh, a return from land uh, in, in terms of uh, the, the concept of the agricultural policies that goes on under the name of cross compliance. Uh, the second concept is uh, help farmer in uh, apply or um, do a better or more sustainable uh, agricultural practices. In, in the short terms, be more friendly with the environment, with the, with the, with the agricultural practices. Uh, here you can see some key findings about Galileo and Enius that are a key enabler, enabler for agricultural application. You just can see the, 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 the link, the strictly link between the information that comes from the satellite and that goes directly to the, the, the farmers or this new concept of farmers that we know about the name of agri precision agriculture. Uh, so this information can help uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, farmers to have an uh, tractor guidance and automatic steering and a variable rate application, help farmers to, to uh, use uh, a better old uh, chemical input, uh, or, or, like a fertilizer or like uh, or also the, 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 the pest uh, product. Um, it, this is an important relation because uh, um, uh, create uh, with this new technology a new opportunity for farmers 
to demonstrate that they, their activity are not worst for, for the nature, but in many cases, and especially in, in Europe, these activities can help and create nature and help the, the, the natural resource to, to maintain their characteristics. Um, here, I can, um, in, in this, uh, I would like to, to, to share with you the information related with this new program uh, that the European Commission created uh, around the program of Copernicus related to this common platform, this is a new common platform. Uh, I have to tell you that this is in a, in a way is still a hidden project because it's not well developed developed in all the European member states because the value of this program is very high and member states are not all confident in sharing in a, a really an open, a free platform, all information that are related uh, to the, 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 the farmers' activity of specific uh, countries. But uh, in, in, here in the, in the slide you can see uh, the image of uh, this common cloud platform that is the idea of how to be uh, the, the cloud hosted uh, linked with the Copernicus that is not only referred to the capacity to manage the, the, the satellite information but is referred to the capacity to interconnect different uh, information data database and create a one common big uh, cloud with all information that are in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in a way integrated each other. You can see here in the slide that you can have uh, information related and came from the, the, the satellite, but it's linked also with the information that farmers are moving in, in, the, in the cloud. So the way that they use the information and the way that they reinsert inside the cloud the information. So uh, this common platform will be for sure in a multi multi-actor platform that take together, in, interaging together different uh, different uh, uh, people and different uh, the board, public body like a managing authority or payment agency, policy makers, farmers, advisors, institutional private partners, all can interact, can use the, the information inside the platform and can uh, enrich this database related with, with this new information. So this will help for sure the activities of farmers, but also will help the, the public bodies to do uh, better the, the to do better the the the, the control activity for example, if I referring on payment uh, agency that manage all the, the financial um, uh, the financial the, the, the financial money related with the cap cap policy. Uh, here in this uh, farm sustainability platform, you can have uh, two different uh, uh, elements. Uh, you, we can refer with the data that are uh, inside this platform. We have uh, the agricultural parcel, so that uh, a way to classify the land. Uh, and also, uh, you have information about the rain, environment, soil. Uh, you have all kind of map of satellite, imaginary external abyss. So it's in a huge uh, level of uh, information that come together in a common cloud. And the 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 specificity of this common this common cloud is that it's uh, free for everybody to access. It's free for in the beginning, general information. After that, uh, with this protocol, the DIAS is a kind of a protocol of interchanging data. Uh, the people or farmers that want more effective information can get some uh, some uh, imagining more more uh, deeply uh, resolution with uh, with an highly resolution 
or, or more uh, specific information, they can get it with a kind of, uh, of um, uh, um, um, very low level of uh, um, payment services. Uh, these services are, from this platform, you can apply services for uh, different people, a different actor, and uh, the, the, the program uh, look to, to, to design a new uh, nutrient because uh, it's, uh, this, uh, this, uh, the, the first objective of this project is design a new nutrient management uh, management planning related with the chemical products in uh, in uh, agriculture so in a way they try to help farmers to use in a better way the chemical products to for have two final to get to final goals uh, first one is uh, uh, have a, a more sustainable practices so more friendly more environmental friendly uh, practice in the in the second side help also farmers to reduce the cost to get uh, an, uh, an a better income for the activities uh, the platform is uh, the characteristic of platform uh, that is uh, an open platform help also different of uh, different kind of uh, technology to interact I can refer here, uh, you see in the slide, with a, a sample, uh, with a grand sensor that we use, and I will show later in the, in the last uh, slides, uh, that are used in, at a local level for farmers to, to get information related with the humidity of the soil or related with the, with the climate uh, uh, change, the rain, uh, this kind of information that are helpful for farmers to understand the good way to, uh, to interact with some pest or with, uh, with the problem of fertility of the soil. So they determine uh, the day in which uh, the farmer can can do the, 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 the fertilization to the soil or can do the, the best treatment. Um, and uh, the, the, the characteristics of uh, this uh, uh, common integration from a common platform, satellites and, uh, and uh, uh, remote sensing techniques is only to help farmers in doing better their activities. Here we don't like to, to talk or to, to, to show, to say that with this, uh, uh, this uh, system or this new technology, we can, sub we can substitute farmers in their work. Uh, we, we, we like here to say that uh, this, all these techniques, all this technology and information uh, will help farmers in doing better. And uh, they, the, the, the object of these techniques is uh, push farmers in a, in, a, in a right way, respect the environment and respect also the productivity of their farm. Uh, but it's important to recognize that the role of the human people, uh, the role of farmers in managing and also in, uh, in creating information and in using information still remain an important role. Uh, we can help uh, farmers to to get more uh, uh, specified and more more uh, in, uh, in information more more uh, specific for the problem but we have to 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 recognize that we cannot substitute farmers and they work uh, here you you find uh, 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 th four elements that will guide the, the general uh, step and um, related to a nutrient management plan that start with uh, a first step that is uh, inventory of internal resources or so understanding soil and farm and producer. So in this, in this step, farmers must understand the context. So what fertilizer can they use? What type of soil do they have with historical data? So this information are important 
for farmers to, to, to know what, where they are and what they are. Which kind of uh, uh, which kind of input they can they can use? Uh, which kind of uh, uh, asset of farm they are available? Uh, this is important for them to understand the activities that they want to do. Uh, uh, this uh, in, is uh, the, the 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 first the first step. It uh, is uh, the the first line to create and a kind of a guide to manage the nutrients. After that, farmers, in, the, in this first step, we can not forget that the knowledge of farmers play a strong role, always. So, many information are uh, related and based on historical data, but also we have not forget that many information are also based on the the, the capacity and knowledge of farmers the they ex experience so take together these two uh, source of information help them to do better they work for sure after that we go to the to the second step that is related with the strategic plan. It's a, a, a multi-year, it's a long-term vision. Uh, we cannot uh, organize a farm uh, uh, thinking on a short period. It's impossible. We, the results of a good practices need time to be expressed. So in, in this way, uh, help farmers to create their strategic plan related to, to the to the management of uh, the the input of um, the the nutrient uh, input is important so the strategic plan provides a guideline to follow help farmer in organize better day day uh, the activity that they need to do each day but also we have to to stress that the strategic plan must not be seen as a, a, a monolithic plan. Uh, this plan needs to be uh, dynamic, uh, need to be reviewed e each year because the context maybe can change year by year, it cannot be the same on the first year. Uh, after that, uh, we go, we move to the, to the uh, step three, the annual plan that define the field specific application rates for fertilizers and manure. With the annual plan, we identify the level of input or nutrients that we need to apport, give to the, to the soil to improve the fertilization, to improve the, the, organic, uh, uh, the organic level uh, of, uh, of soil. Uh, in, in, in a short, terms to understand the nutrient budget and in this way the the, the farmers start to uh, elaborate in their mind uh, the level so the, the the quantity of fertilizer that they need to 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 add and uh, this help them to save money not uh, follow the, 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 the normal or standardized receipt, but create an, a personal receipt that in, in many situations help them to, to reduce the quantity level of, uh, of external input. The last step that is uh, important to recognize is that all the information created in the first three steps must be recorded. And the records are mostly performance in situ. It's important to create the common platform. It's important. Uh, it's much more important if information and experience made by farmer can be recorded in the platform. And this information uh, goes to improve the validity and the quality of information that all or the technology 
that can uh, they can uh, uh, they can produce. There are certain basic elements that all nutrient management plan should seek to contain. Uh, um, these elements you see in the slide very quickly are related with uh, farming practices, product and the producer, farmer objectives, environment information, soil information. Uh, all these data improve the, 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 and uh, enlarge the knowledge of farmers. And that all of this information take together improve the capacity of farmers to have a more sustainable practices, to follow uh, a, 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 a typology of farming that are more environmental friendly in a way and a more also economic uh, uh, performance. Uh, if uh, we can see in a specific, uh, when we talk about farming practice, we talk about uh, historical data assessing the pest management practice, for example, also techniques determine preferred application technique. Uh, here, time and again, I would like to stress that these tools must help farmers, not substitute them. In many, in many uh, new, in this new concept of agriculture, precision agriculture, many times we we see that uh, the techniques, in a way, we can substitute knowledge of farm, can give him the the, the perfect receipt to do. This is not always a, a good practices because. Uh, the information, if are not contextualized with the expertise at the local level, sometimes you can have a, a big mistake. So it's important to understand that the experience of farmers still play a strong role on managing and creating information that help farmers in, in the do better farming. Um, we can go to the second uh, uh, sides of product and producers uh, when how to apply manure on handling and storage uh, producer for minimizing the potential for nutrient loss around the, the barn yard or farmer objectives that are relating on setting realistic yield goals nutrient budget respective yields and times and so on uh, so in the process of for the nutrient management plan all this information play a strong role and uh, again a nutrient management plan can be implemented by simple record keeping or via complex computer based tools uh, here that is uh, just the introduction of the more empirical part that I would like to show, it's important to understand that the technology available for, for farmers in this moment are improved a lot. We can use a, a mobile phone application to manage uh, an, a, an, really a high level of information and to manage also software that can be um, uh, interconnected with the cloud hosted or the common platform directly. So farmers with the mobile phone can interact with the cloud, can use information that are stored in the cloud, that can put the record information in the cloud. They can use software uh, made available from the cloud. They can use uh, imaginary uh, made uh, made uh, available from the cloud that they in the same time can give an accurate uh, information feedback to the cloud respect of uh, his activities what he is doing in a moment and in which parcel of land is acting so this uh, this exchanging data from technology and farmer knowledge of farmers or, or farmers acting uh, are 
uh, made possible from from uh, uh, this new technology of mobile uh, mobile phone and application and software specific for mobile phone so in 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 this sense the the real revolution in technology in agricultural sector in this moment is related uh, strongly related with the mobile phone and also the the the, the, the software connected to to him uh, now i would like to show you a, a, a tool that uh, in which i am working in that is still under construction because we had this COVID problem, so we, we stopped a little bit the, the, the evolution of this tool because uh, uh, we, we had in the last six months the, the capacity, the, our capacity to connect farmers, to work with them, but reduce a lot. Uh, because in the first time we need the physical contact to, to with farmer to understand the, 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 the context where he lives. And this physical contact uh, uh, was impossible uh, to do in the last, uh, in the last months. But uh, just to show you what we are doing, we are creating a um, link with a, a common platform and a farm management information system. So we are creating a kind of software that uh, uh, will uh, interconnect in one side with the, the services uh, 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 through the DIAS connection, DIAS protocol with the satellites. And the other side, we are uh, in, in interconnecting the, uh, the, 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 the system uh, of, uh, of farmer uh, related to the management the management of information. In many cases, this system is still on paper uh, uh, tool, but with this farm management information system that we like to, to show them, we will uh, um, digitalize all paper information and introduce this information in, in the system that will be interconnected with, with uh, open data services made available by, by, pub, by public body. Uh, we call this platform Agro 4.0. The platform is the digital solution that support the farm and management information system. The platform can interact with all public information systems. So the software that we are creating is really a flexible one. Uh, this software, we that uh, the, the can adapt for all different uh, uh, database uh, uh, solutions. So uh, it's a, we don't need a specific uh, um, uh, software uh, uh, integration, but uh, uh, we are working really uh, in a, an open solution. So a kind of uh, uh, solution that can interact with all different, uh, different uh, data source. Uh, here you can see a kind of a web application that we are working on. Um, we have uh, several different models and functions. We have an agro manager that uh, is referred with the management of farmer asset and planning of farming practices. We have an agro management of farm input. We have an agro doc that is a management of uh, all farm documents. Uh, agro trust is a management of waste. Agro CMMS is a farm program for adjustment and calibration of, of machine. You know that machine that you use for pest control, they need a kind of uh, calibration for uh, um, uh, just to use in the best in the best way the the the, the, the best product. Uh, we have an agro trap that is a, a, a module for pest pest management. But also we are working in a model for the water control, for the agro market and monitoring, uh, agro green calculator that is a, a kind of uh, uh, system that uh, calculates the level of uh, sustainability indicators. That is this um, environmental indicators. So there are many programs in Europe that are defining these indicators. 
but also we have a, a model for statistical self-reporting and a model of uh, the, the uh, privacy and uh, and um, uh, the, the quality of the of the data. Uh, here you see again the third section that is agrogeo model of thematic maps, model of data import export, and agri agrolab that is a management of different land and food screening. Uh, I can show in this slide some examples of uh, uh, the, 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 the models that we are working on. Here is an example of uh, Agro 4.0 and uh, is related on the management of uh, uh, farming practices. And you, know, you have all the uh, different folder where the, the farmer can, uh, can find in automatic all information deriving from the, the connection of uh, the, 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 the uh, common platform or, 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 or open data public database and also you have uh, folders where farmer can record the the information uh, here you can see a, a screenshot of uh, some application that when you like to to monitoring uh, what the farmer uh, did or recorded in the, in the system, and the, 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 the software to create also the map uh, with all the elements that can, can uh, in all elements, you, you have the metadata that can explain in that kind of parcel uh, what, which kind of uh, uh, activity uh, the, the farmer did in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the past. Uh, here some other application. We are working on uh, a new tool. Uh, here you see the Olivia trap. is a, a new tool that uh, anticipate pest attack. We are working with these uh, remote sensors that are able to get uh, uh, information in real time. Uh, and here, uh, this is a specific uh, with the kind of disease that we call in Italy la mosca, the, the, of, uh, the, the, the flyer of uh, olive tree. And you have uh, here a system that will capture the, the, the level of uh, flyer percent. And you have uh, an automatic system that counts the number of flyer and can give back to the system the information on which when is a, a, a good moment to uh, to to go in a field and make the treatment against these uh, these flyers? Here we have another solution that is a storage and registered use of pesticide. Uh, you have here the storage uh, box for pesticide and a, a balance uh, for for. Uh, um, the, 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 the weight of, of, of pesticide. In automatic, when uh, the farmers need to use, can keep the product from the storage, can uh, put on the balance, and the balance in automatic register the level of, uh, of the weight. After that, uh, after the farmer used the product, if the product uh, is completely used, the, the in automatic the system registers the, 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 the quantity of products that the farmer use in that application or if you put back uh, some some products you can put on a balance the balance registered the ways in automatic records in the system the, the, the level of the product that remain after after the treatment uh, so it's a, it's a also in this uh, with this uh, Tool, we try to help farmer in doing better the, 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 the activities. Last uh, product in which we are working on is uh, a kit for irrigation water management. Uh, the water use is one of the main problems in the world. Water is a kind of resource really critical. We have to two uh, main points on this resource. The first one is that water is a limited resource. The quantity of the water is limited, so it's a, a scarce resource. 
The second level is that the quality of water must be um, uh, must be uh, protect. So we need to use less water, but also we need to maintain water uh, quality of water in good condition. So here we we uh, working in a, in a kind of a, a remote sensor and techni technology that create an automatic registration on the use of water in the irrigation practices. So these toolkits uh, give the information to farmers when is the right time to irrigate land. And also how many hours with the system registered in, in a farm, how many times the irrigation must, uh, must be on. Uh, so this is another tools that help farmers to 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 improve the the farmings. So just to conclude, uh, we are working on uh, create a digital solution for farmers just to help them in doing better uh, they 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 work in the week. Here I can synthesize three levels of help. The first one, we can say that uh, we like to help farmers in the transition process, which is characterizing the way to manage and organize farm asset practices and business process, as well as relational with economic and consumption system. So farmer cannot be alone in this moment. Uh, the farmer needs new tools that change a way to communicate, to register the monitoring the farming action, uh, the processing, the products and the market, and help them to adopt a new strategies that are more sustainable for the environment, but also are in a, in a way able to overcome the barrier like a small dimension, like a neutral constraint, isolation, individualistic behavior, low quantity of product. Uh, second level of help is to improve a farmer's way to be engaged in a new European sustainability. Uh, the new European sustainability objects are very strong linked with the environment. Uh, so all the new CAP tools are strongly related with environment objectives. So we need to, with this new uh, technology, we like to help uh, farmers uh, to get uh, to be in line with uh, these uh, new sustainability European objectives. Uh, an evolution of uh, this uh, to the tools, the farm management information system that we are designing is uh, uh, made by European uh, Commission that are working on really a, a similar tools that can be used by farmers uh, with a mobile phone. This, uh, this tool is, uh, and I will share uh, with you, I will send uh, to you material on that is a, a, a system that will be free for farmers in managing the information that we are we are uh, so in the previous slide last one is that the third level of help is uh, uh, um, uh, the, is is uh, to uh, reduce uh, to get a less bureaucracy uh, so the the, the 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 cap policy and the cap instruments are with a high level of bureaucracy. The access to these uh, instruments is sometimes is very complicated with the, for farmers. So we we like to help um, uh, farmers in be more clever to have a more clever monitoring and control on the use of cap subsidies to to get more in the the the, the cost compliance concept uh, for example to 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 answer better on all the engagements that farmers uh, uh, get when when 
when uh, uh, apply uh, or assessed on 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 a kind of um, uh, public measure. So, uh, reorganize the access modality to cap subsidies, for example, uh, uh, reduce the level of paper, uh, create a way uh, to access of cap subsidies only in automatic uh, with uh, with uh, automatic documents. Uh, uh, give information or get information from database and reduce the, the level of digitalization of information from, from farmers. So all this help to reduce in a way bureaucracy, but also to uh, create an, a, a, different, a different level of uh, information error. So many information sometimes when are uh, uh, the, the digitalized uh, different times uh, the same information uh, the error uh, the, that can be linked with this information sometimes is very high so the same information sometimes appear in one way <laughs> other times other times in, in different way so in this uh, in this way we can uh, reduce uh, the the level of uh, error in management of uh, of information with this, uh, I, I uh, think to conclude the, the, my presentation and I'm uh, uh, free to, to answer uh, your, uh, your uh, question. Thank you for everybody and uh, I'm waiting for the question. Thank you, Luigi, for your presentation. Uh, as it was uh, very complete, we will have uh, very little time for the Q&A session, so we will uh, limit ourselves to a few questions. Uh, so here comes the first. I uh, give the, the floor uh, until the end. OK, first question, Jean. Resistance to change must have been huge. Without the cap or legislation, probably impossible. So consider therefore situation in Africa. What can you advise in terms of getting them on board? Uh, thank you, Jean. It's a quite nice question. Uh, probably the answer will not be the, so so nice, but uh, I think that in this moment the opportunity that the management of technology that manages the information can help a lot this situation. We can share very easily with farmers in Africa same system of information. When we talk about the common platform, a cloud, an open cloud, means that uh, farmer in Africa can have a free access to this information, they can receive the same, the same, uh, the same help. This is in a way related to technology after the other things is the policy if we consider the situation in africa i think that uh, the, the in terms of policy um, in africa they need to invest a lot uh, on a diff uh, on a measure that can help farmer to improve but not in a, in line with the modernization, I think that it's much better to preserve the uh, capacity or the structure of, of a family farm and uh, to work uh, in a line that we create and, uh, and uh, goes under the name of a rural development policies. So a kind of a structure like a, a, a rural development policies uh, for sure could help uh, farmers to improve in, in, in Africa in the right way and they at the same time will have a technology that can help them in, in, in improving in the farming practices in line with the sustainability. Next question. Uh, Gianluigi Renzi, dear Pierluigi, thanks a lot for your presentation. Many greetings from Campania on monitoring of oil fly. I gave a standing ovation. Can you please tell us how many sensors 
Hector does the system need? How many farms did adopt this tool above all in Italy? Uh, thanks, Gianluigi. The, we are working on uh, on this new 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 technology. Uh, it's still not um, not in a, in a market. We are in a, in a pilot project. Uh, just to answer uh, on uh, your uh, on your. Uh, um, uh, information question: uh, the, the the trappola uh, can have a, a, a photo camera, a camera for for photo. It can have a, a mini uh, sensor for um, uh, temperature, uh, for the humidity, uh, for rain. Uh, the the level of resolution of camera is very high. The connection it's uh, uh, made in the previous. Uh, in the previous prototype with the, with the SIM card, now we are looking for this new solution uh, that uh, that manage that manage the the, the, the signals of of uh, uh, internet connection. Uh, you can manage with these uh, tools. Uh, you can manage. Uh, uh, it's depending, of course, on on the condition of. Uh, the, the area if you have a hill if you, if a land landscape if you have a, a, a deep a, a deep situation uh, but normally you can have a, um, per one two hectare you can have two of these uh, are enough two of this uh, solution related for um, to, 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 to monitoring the flies. And to, to complete, we are um, um, experiment this in, uh, in uh, uh, 10 farmers in Umbria. Uh, uh, the farmer, we are experiment for two, uh, two uh, main insects. The first one is the fly uh, for the olive tree. The second is uh, the, 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 the pest of uh, vineyards. Um, I will. Uh, I forgot in this moment the name, but uh, I will. Uh, I will uh, add soon. Thank you. Next question. Uh, thank you, Pierre Luigi. We are uh, well. We have uh, reached the end of the event uh, since it is uh, six uh, thirty. So sorry for the short Q&A session, but since your Q &A, your presentation was very complete, uh, we are uh, out of time. So. To all person who have uh, an answer question, if you want to receive an answer, please go to the forum uh, and ask uh, them here. We will uh, gladly forward them to Pierre Luigi if he has time to answer them. So thank you very much, uh, all of you, for your participation. And uh, I wish you a great evening or morning or day, depending on where you are. And uh, hope to see you uh, next week for the next webinar. Thank you all. Goodbye. <laughs>